Welcome to SNC's Critical Insights. I'm Annie Ostrager, a partner in the firm's litigation group, one of the co-heads of our labor and employment group, and a member of our criminal defense and investigations group. With me today is my partner, Tracy High, who is also co-head of the labor and employment group. We both focus on whistleblower litigation and investigations, among other things. So we're here today to provide an update on recent developments with the SEC's whistleblower program. We'll begin by providing a brief overview of the program, including new amendments to the SEC's whistleblower rules. Then we'll talk about two cases recently brought by whistleblowers against the SEC in the Third and Fifth Circuits involving denials of whistleblower awards. With that, Tracy, can you provide us with some background on the SEC whistleblower regime to frame our discussion? Hi, Annie. Yes, it's really great to be with you this summer to discuss recent activity relating to whistleblower awards under the SEC's whistleblower program. I'll kick it off with a brief overview of the SEC's program, which includes both protections and incentives for whistleblowers. As we know, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, SOX, as modified by the Dodd-Frank Act, provides general protections and incentives for whistleblowers who report potential violations of the securities laws, along with general protections against retaliation and assurances of anonymity. Dodd-Frank incentivizes potential informants to come forward with information by authorizing the SEC to grant awards to whistleblowers. The SEC has issued regulations to create and describe the whistleblowing program and implements these provisions of Dodd-Frank. Under the program, an individual who voluntarily provides independent information of wrongdoing to the SEC may receive a portion of the recovery if the information leads to the successful enforcement in a federal court or an administrative action that leads the SEC to obtain monetary sanctions of at least $1 million. Right. And if those criteria are satisfied, the whistleblower can receive between 10 and 30 percent of the SEC's recovery from the action based on multiple factors, including the significance of the information the whistleblower provided, the degree of assistance provided, and the SEC's interest in deterring similar violations. The SEC can also grant awards to multiple individuals in one action if they jointly provide original information to the agency, regardless of who first discovered or developed the information. In order to collect an award, however, the whistleblower has to be careful to follow the rules and procedures prescribed by the SEC for filing reward claims. For example, Rule 21F9 lays out the requirements for submitting original information to the SEC in order to collect an award. Generally, that rule has been interpreted to require that whistleblowers report wrongdoing directly to the SEC, among other requirements. While the SEC may deny awards for a failure to meet those requirements, the dollar amount that whistleblowers are able to collect can be significant, as you pointed out, Tracy, which highlights the importance of would-be whistleblowers following these procedures. And Tracy, now maybe you want to talk a little bit about the recent amendments to the program. Sure, Annie. Um, There are two recent amendments that bear on the potential likelihood and magnitude of recovery. One amendment to the whistleblower program authorizes the SEC to make awards for related non-SEC actions even if they may be more directly connected to other agencies. The second recent amendment gives the SEC discretion to grant a larger award in appropriate circumstances. That is, the commission now has discretion to grant an award closer to the 30% statutory limit if it believes that a larger amount is warranted based on the whistleblower's actions. At the same time, the amendment emphasizes that the SEC cannot decrease the size of an award below 10%, even in cases where that seems to yield too large of a recovery. Overall, these two amendments seem to reflect the agency's readiness to grant more and larger awards to whistleblowers. 
Yes, this does seem to be a trend that we're seeing. And in fiscal year 2022, the SEC granted the second highest number and dollar amount of awards in the program's history, with approximately $229 million granted across 103 awards. More than 12,300 tips were documented during that year as well. So while this large number demonstrates widespread awareness and availment of the whistleblower program, it does also reflect that not all claims will result in such awards. Thanks, Annie. Now, against this background information, let's turn to two recent cases involving whistleblower awards from the SEC. Yes. So recently, unsuccessful claimants have brought claims about the SEC's administration of its program in court, arguing that the SEC was using its discretion to deny awards too liberally. The Third Circuit recently considered whether an associate of a whistleblower who was granted an SEC award was also entitled to an award. In 2022, the SEC awarded Carson Block $14 million after his report of alleged fraud and mismanagement which led to an SEC investigation and resulted in a $55.6 million fine against the company. That's a large award. Uh, Will you tell us a little bit more about the facts there? Yes. Block, an activist short seller, and his associate, Kevin Barnes, allegedly gained knowledge of fraud and mismanagement at a Chinese advertising company. Block and Barnes published an online report about the company's alleged wrongdoing before Barnes later emailed the report to the SEC. As we talked about a couple of minutes ago, the SEC's Rule 21F9 requires that whistleblowers report directly to the SEC. Block didn't follow the exact reporting procedures required under the program because the report was published online before it was submitted to the agency, but the commission waived the procedural requirements for Block in what they described as the public interest in light of the unusual facts and circumstances presented by the case. Did the SEC find out about the report through Block's email before it discovered the online publication? So interestingly, in its initial decision, the SEC noted that Block's email played no role in initiating its investigation because the commission staff had located the report independently. Although Block earned a significant award, his associate was unsuccessful when he tried to file his own whistleblower claim arising out of the same report. So What was the issue in Barnes's application, Tracy? Well, as we mentioned, the SEC can grant awards to multiple whistleblowers in the same action. However, the agency considers the merits of each whistleblower's claim independently. So the issue here is that the requirement under Rule 21F9 that whistleblowers must provide information directly to the SEC in order successfully to claim an award was the sticking point. Despite the SEC's decision to waive the procedural requirements of this rule for Block, the agency did not grant the same leniency to Barnes. Specifically, in denying Barnes's award, the SEC noted that he never provided the information directly to the SEC and instead published it only online, a process that doesn't follow Rule 21F9. Additionally, the SEC explained that no existing procedural waiver provisions applied to Barnes, and he wasn't able to prove that extraordinary circumstances prevented him from filing directly with the SEC or that waiving the procedural requirements in his case were in the public interest. And Barnes challenged the SEC's decision? Barnes appealed to the Third Circuit, Annie, and the court considered the disparate outcomes between their whistleblower claims. The Third Circuit upheld the SEC's decision to deny Barnes's claim. However, while holding that the SEC had not acted arbitrarily or capriciously in denying Barnes the award, the court did express misgivings with the SEC's reasoning. In fact, the court even noted that the agency arguably should have denied Block the award on the same ground that it denied Barnes. 
So it seems like the standard played a significant role in the Third Circuit's decision here. And the Third Circuit reasoned that Barnes could not peg his argument for an award to the fact that Block's award was granted in spite of failure to comply with Rule 21 F9. Barnes was required to demonstrate without reference to Block why he was entitled to an award despite his own independent failure to comply with the rule and failed to do so here. In light of the Third Circuit's decision to uphold the SEC's denial, Barnes's case demonstrates the degree to which the SEC has discretion in this space when granting or denying an award. So Tracy, now let's talk a little bit about the Fifth Circuit opinion we referenced. So the Fifth Circuit recently decided Bass v. SEC, which asked whether the whistleblower had acted in an individual capacity as required under the SEC's program. The SEC initially denied Bass's award. And what were the facts here? Kyle Bass owned and worked at an investment firm, Heyman Capital. In 2015, he learned information about a Ponzi scheme at another company and investigated the wrongdoing with the goal of reporting to the SEC. The firm's general counsel was the first individual to contact the SEC. However, Bass himself had conducted independent research to uncover the misconduct, personally communicated with the SEC during multiple meetings, and filed a TCR report in compliance with SEC reporting procedures. Bass was listed as the sole complainant on the report. Even so, the SEC initially denied Bass a whistleblower award. Although he had provided the SEC with information about a Ponzi scheme that led to sanctions, criminal convictions, and the like, the agency denied his claim for a $2.5 million award under the program. Right, and here the SEC focused on the statutory requirement that the whistleblower must be an individual because companies or entities are not eligible for awards. The agency took the position that Bass didn't fall under the statutory definition of an individual whistleblower as he'd worked alongside agents of his investment firm. The SEC's view was that the firm's employees who helped Bass, including the general counsel who initially contacted the agency about the wrongdoing, were acting on behalf of the firm and not on behalf of Bass as an individual, which disqualified him under the statute. Bass appealed, claiming that the SEC had acted arbitrarily and capriciously in its decision to deny him an award. Tracy, can you talk a little bit about the appeal? Sure. Bass first argued that the SEC ignored extensive evidence of his individual involvement, including evidence that the firm's general counsel was, in fact, acting on Bass's behalf. Second, he argued that the SEC's interpretation of the individual whistleblower definition was too narrow and that the denial of his claim created a presumption of entity action that creates evidentiary hurdles for claimants beyond what is required by statute. So essentially, he argued that the SEC's denial of his award, in this case on the ground that he had not acted in an individual capacity, created an almost impossible standard for similarly situated whistleblowers to prevail in future cases. And finally, he argued that the SEC's dismissal relied in part on his missed filing deadline, but that this missed filing deadline had been enacted four years after he initially blew the whistle. Bass argued that enforcing this deadline years after the fact created an impermissible retroactive effect that was both arbitrary and capricious. Annie, how did the Fifth Circuit decide? Well, Tracy, that might have to be the subject of a future SNC Critical Insights episode because in an unusual move, the SEC asked the Fifth Circuit to stay Bass's appeal so it could reconsider the case and issue a new final order. The court granted the SEC's motion, so that is happening right now, and it remains to be seen whether the SEC will grant an award or what will come next and what the implications will be for future would-be whistleblowers and how the line drawing happens around whether a person is acting as an individual whistleblower and or self-reporting conduct to an agency on behalf of a company, which is something that we regularly encounter. 
So Tracy, let's talk now a little bit about key takeaways from these cases and these amendments. Well, Annie, first, it's important important to note that although the two recent amendments to the SEC's whistleblower program expanded the program scope and offered an avenue for the SEC to grant larger awards, the commission also will be able to cabin recovery by enforcing procedural reporting requirements. The commission's decision to deny Barnes an award while granting a sizable award to his colleague Block underscores the importance placed on direct reporting to the SEC. However, we notice court scrutiny over the SEC's administration of its whistleblower program, along with the commission's willingness to reconsider its own decisions. The SEC's unusual second look in the Bass case will likely provide us with more guidance on the commission's requirements for individual reporting. When this decision is made, we'll plan to discuss its implication on a future episode of Critical Insights. Thanks, Tracy. In light of the recent amendments and court decisions, the SEC whistleblower program remains a powerful incentive for individuals to report suspected corporate wrongdoing. Companies should seek to maintain robust internal compliance programs to facilitate effective communication between employees and company leadership so that they can respond to alleged wrongdoing alongside individual reporters and consider whether proactive cooperation with the commission makes sense. And of course, companies need to be attuned to the requirement that they not put roadblocks in the way of whistleblowers who would otherwise report to the SEC. And that has also been the subject of a lot of scrutiny from the SEC recently. As the SEC and courts continue to hear challenges from potential whistleblowers seeking awards, it remains important to stay aware of the regulatory landscape here and we'll continue to monitor this area. And thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. For more information about our practice, please visit us on the web at www.sulcrom.com. Mm-hmm.